And that does remind me to something negative that I didn't want to talk about, but I guess I have to. And that is um, our firm with Wilmer Hale did not succeed on the Patel decision. Um, that was, that was your guy. You guys are fighting that one. Yeah, that was Ira was lead counsel and a lot of people at the firm were working on it and Wilmer Hale as well. Wilmer Hale argued it. We, five four, we got Justice Gorsuch and the historically progressive judges, justices. To be honest with you, we I, I was surprised. We we're surprised. It's I mean, a long pace. Decision, a completely ridiculous decision, yeah. It is, but but you know, putting aside the petition for review stuff, it probably kills challenges to USCIS denials in federal court. Probably does. Um, it is, and, and so in that sense, it's 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 huge and it's crazy. And so, even if you can see that USCIS uh, applied the adverse credibility standard incorrectly, for example, in the Ninth Circuit, you might not have an avenue to challenge that. It's a crazy conclusion, and it's one that the Supreme Court refused to reach in Saint Cyr twenty years ago, but that it had no problem making now with a different court. How far reaching now? The podcast before this was an interview with Brian Green, uh, interviewed uh, Ralph uh, Hua, uh, and they talked about this. So they go into the facts and that for viewers. But essentially, um, it's if USCIS or the immigration judge makes a error in their in a determination of a factual basis, and to me, it's a legal error what they were doing. So I'm not sure why that. Well, I didn't read the. I only read the dissent. I read, I haven't read the the thing yet. The majority, but overall, it's just ridiculous. But. Um, is this going to affect like if someone does an EB1A and like the turn they get denied and they go to federal court? Like, could this touch upon every kind of immigration case or how does it look? Um, <laughs> Let's put you on the probably, probably, probably. I, I don't know about EB1A for adjustment of status under 245A. It probably does, at least for the discretionary forms of relief. Yeah. There is a there was already a problem with going to federal court because the jurisdiction savings clause funnels these things into circuit court rather than district court. It gets really confusing. But there was always this argument that for adjustment of status and other forms, but mainly adjustment of status when you're talking about USCIS, there was still review. But there's another statute that takes away review and the jurisdiction savings clause for questions of law and questions of constitutionality does not, does not necessarily apply to district court, it does, it funnels it into circuit court. So in essence, at least with adjustment of status, if DHS decides not to put the individual into removal proceedings, which then puts a path to circuit review, eventually, if you lose, if you just keep losing, yeah, then it, it might take you, it might take away review. Um, a, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy there. And with the, with the circuit stuff, it's only about the specific, the specified forms of relief. Um, just adjustment of status is one of the specified forms of relief that the statute strips jurisdiction of, according to the Supreme Court. And so Mr. Patel, for example, there was a preliminary finding that he lied and that he intended to say he was a U.S. citizen on a uh, driver's license application in Georgia. Now, even though that goes to whether he was admissible and doesn't even go to whether or not necessarily he's eligible for adjustment of status just whether he's removable in the first place or whether he is preliminarily in need of a waiver for example because it was a factual question somehow related to adjustment of status the supreme court five to four said that the circuits can't review the ij and the bia's decision it makes it that much more important to win before the ij and the bia now this doesn't apply to asylum and there are and mixed questions of law and fact remain reviewable. The Fifth Circuit just said that this week, and the in the Supreme Court's Guerrero La Spria decision said it two terms ago. But um, no, it's a bad decision, and we're devastated. <laughs> Didn't want to talk about it, but here I am talking about Patel. I mean, we got a it's an unbelievable decision, um, and it's like. Could this be undone? They make another decision next year, or like because there's so many cases that we touched upon this. But will that Supreme Court redo a decision they just made? It's five to four, so it was close. I'm not a Supreme Court watcher that close to be able to tell you how this stuff works. But um, 
It's really wow. messed up. It's really messed up. Like what happened? Well, Briar Briar was in dissent, and Briar was just replaced by Justice Jackson. So I, I don't think I think you still have a five to four at a minimum. Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's wonky. Congress can change it easy. Congress can. It's all about the statute. Yeah. That Congress wrote. Congress could. And you know, in response to Saint Cyr, Congress wrote the save the two forty two A two D the jurisdiction savings provision. So Congress knows how to react to Supreme Court jurisdiction decisions. I mean, it's so, been a while since they were Bill willing to do any uh, immigration yeah. relief. Like, right. Were, so like DACA would have been the way to go, like this, or the other, this myriad of stuff like that, or like right. uh, look, it's Roe v. Wade if they're going to do something like that. One's uh, that shoe's going to drop. When is that supposed to drop? <laughs> when is this about? There's a lot, and there's another immigration case coming down that might uh, bar nationwide injunctions and in immigration cases, and yeah, certainly might be. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot, a lot going on. Uh, this is the Supreme Court we have for the foreseeable future. Yeah, all the old old guys and uh, gals are. I mean, who else has led? It, it, it's refreshed. All the old guard seems gone. I don't think there's too many left over that were aging out. Justice Thomas is the most senior individual on the court. He looks pretty healthy. Um, no comment there. Just <laughs> he has been he has been on the court the longest. <laughs>